Hello, SNC1D. Mr. LaRusso again. So I would like to take a little bit of time to go through this very first note on static electricity. Um, I showed a couple of, uh, posted, I should say, a couple of demonstrations of static electricity, but I'd like to get a little bit more detail on what it's all about. So first of all, static electricity. Well, the question is, what is it? So static electricity is a buildup of charge on a material where the charge is not free to move. Now, we have a special name for materials like this. Materials like this are called insulators, and they're designed, um, well, their properties are at least limit the free flow of electric charges. Well, and that brings us to the next question. What are charges? Well, charges occur when materials have a buildup or a deficit of electrons, and this is the key thing, a buildup or a deficit of electrons. And the reason why this is important, because this actually goes back before the discovery of the electron. Before they discovered the electron, they were familiar with charges. They just didn't know what they were. So they named them positive and negative. But then after we discovered the electrons, it turned out that the convention that was designed back in the days of Ben Franklin turned out to be incorrect. So they had to readjust the model to represent or uh, the, the new understanding that we have electrons and protons. And that explains some weird things. We say that electrons are negatively charged and protons are positively charged. And then of course we have things called neutrons which have no charge whatsoever. But it's very strange because the thing that actually moves to make electricity are the electrons. The question is, why did we make the charge on the electrons negative? Nobody likes working with negative numbers. Why did we make those numbers negative? It actually had to do with a mistake that was made in the very early days before we discovered what electrons were. It used to be thought that electricity was a was a fluid and it flowed much like water. Um, so when something gained this electric fluid, it became positive. When something lost this electric fluid, it became negative. Well, the problem was there's no such thing as an electric fluid. It turned out that what was causing these charges were the flows of these things called electrons, which were discovered after the fact. Well, the way the convention was set up, it turns out that the electrons had to have a negative number in order to match what was already established back in the day before the discovery. So that's why our circuits are a little bit weird, and we're going to talk a little bit more into that. So again, why is it that the electrons are free, uh, the ones that are the main charge carrier? Well, it has to do with the way solids work. With our solids, the protons and neutrons, they're locked in the nucleus, and the nucleus can't move. But the last electron on the last shell, we call those the valence shells, um, those are the ones that were free to move, um, or freer to move, from one atom to another. In things like conductors, such as metals, these uh, valence electrons very easily migrate from one point to another. So the primary charge car uh, carrier in electric circuits are the electrons. <clears throat> so a proton is considered to be one positive elemental charge. All right, now um, we have we have something, another unit that we'll talk about, something called a coulomb, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So when we have one proton, we consider that one positive, and that little e stands for elemental charge. An electron, which is symbol is um, an e with a line over top, is considered to be negative one elemental charges, and a neutron, zero and elemental charges. Now, as it turns out, neutrons are basically what happens is when you, when you combine a proton and electron together. The charges cancel out and they become a little bit heavier, but that's something for the future. So let's do a little example. Let's say an atom has a total of 10 protons, but only nine electrons. Well, you can see that the protons outnumber the electrons. And since the protons out uh, outnumber the electrons, this is gonna have a positive charge. And well, what's the positive charge gonna be? It's gonna be the charge difference. So I can replace my protons with positive one elemental charge and my electrons with negative one. So this is basically positive 10 minus nine, and that gives us a difference of positive one elemental charges. So this would have a positive charge of only one uh, proton. And for the record, that is a very, 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 very small amount of charge. Very, very small. When you uh, get static buildup and you um, walk across the floor with your socks and then you get a shock off the doorknob, um, we're talking trillions of charges at that point. This is a very high amount. So what are static charges and what does static mean? The word static 
it means not moving. Stationary. That's where we get stationary from, static, stationary. Static charges build up on surfaces of materials called insulators. Now, insulators um, are materials that do not promote the flow of elect electricity, as opposed to conductors, which allow electricity to flow quite easily. Now, static charges almost never collect on materials called conductors. That isn't entirely true. It's possible to do that, but it's a little harder work because with conductors, when you try to put a charge on them, those charges are free to redistribute across the entire thing. So they're going to spread out as much as possible. Whereas with insulators, those electrons, wherever they land, they're kind of stuck, kind of like uh, flies to uh, fly paper. So what are insulators and what are conductors? Well, again, an insulator. Insulators are materials that don't allow electrons to move easily from one atom to another. So what happens, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, kind of imagine if there were, it was a very sticky material. It's not actually sticky. It just happens to be that the atoms have a really, really, really strong attraction for their electrons. So much so that the electrons get trapped and it's very hard for them to move away. So if we get a deposit of charges on um, excess charges, like extra electrons on an insulator, they tend to just build up on a localized spot. They just, they kind of stick there. And again, it's kind of like flypaper. Um, so... And that's where we get the idea that it's sticky for these electrons because the atoms hold on to them very tightly. Now, with conductors, that's a very different situation. With conductors, the valence electrons are really, really loosely held. Um, very, very easy. Just a slight little nudge will get them to move. In, particularly, in particular, metals such as copper, aluminum, gold, those traditional metals that we think, we think of as conductors, they are organized in a lattice structure where the valence electrons are so loosely held that even the slightest little bit of a push will cause them to flow. So these materials have very low resistance to the flow of charge. That's why these make excellent materials for electrical wiring, where insulators are things that keep us safe. For example, your power supplies uh, for your laptops or for your stereos or for every appliance is usually coated in a uh, like a, a vinyl, a rubber or a plastic. And that's because these materials really do inhibit the flow of electricity, which is good because you don't want to put your hand on uh, copper wire that is charged to 120 volts. That would be very, very dangerous. Okay, so here's our little analogy of conductors um, conductors versus insulators. So let's say you uh, have, take two cookie trays. You spray the bottom of one with an anti-stick spray while covering the bottom of the other with a super thick layer of mega molasses. Now you pour a bag of M&Ms on each tray. Now the tray with the anti-stick spray, the M&Ms would spread out um, much more evenly. They'd spread out um, because there's very little friction they would roll around and they'd cover the whole surface. Whereas on the pan, and that, sorry, and that would be an example of a conductor. Whereas with the pan that had the sticky molasses, wherever those electrons land, they clump up. So this is what we've got here. So here's an example of an insulator. And here the electrons are deposited and they stick here. They, 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 they stick where they land. So we get a concentration of negative charge here but it's very difficult for them to move in either direction because of the material's strong attraction for these electrons. It's kind of like they get stuck there. Um, whereas with a conductor, these charges are super free to move. So what they will do is they will redistribute themselves as far apart from each other as possible and get a nice even distribution across the entire conductor. Um, and that's the advantage of a conductor versus an insulator is that electricity is free to flow around. So what are some examples of very good conductors? Well, any traditional metal. So silver, copper, gold, aluminum, magnesium, tungsten, nickel, mercury, platinum, iron. These are all very, very good conductors. Now, of these conductors, the best are gold and uh, platinum. Those are the best ones. Silver is also very good. And um, it's funny in here, I don't, oh, sorry, right there, copper. And copper is very commonly used. Um, aluminum, these are all things that are, um, can be found in any household appliance and any piece of electronics. Now, there are these materials that are kind of borderline and they're fair conductors, which means they 
conduct electricity okay, but it's not great. So there's still some resistance, but not as much as insulators. So things like um, graphite, nichrome, the human body, damp skin, acid solution, salt water, the earth, water vapor in the air, silicon, germanium. These are all examples of materials that do allow the flow of electricity, but not very efficiently. It still takes a bit of effort. And then we have good insulators. Good insulators really, really inhibit the flow of electricity. Oil, fur, silk, wool, rubber, porcelain and glass, plastic, wood, paper, wax, ebonite. And now here's the thing that always surprises people, pure water. In fact, pure water is a very, very poor conductor of electricity. So why is it that we say that you want to avoid water during electrical storms? Well, the key word is pure water. Pure water has nothing dissolved in it. Well, in everyday nature, that's just not the case. So the stuff that's dissolved in the water, and there's plenty of various salts and, and other compounds, those compounds are what make the water somewhat conductive, right? So lake water isn't as conductive as seawater because in seawater we have a lot more stuff dissolved in specifically salt which really does help with the flow of electricity but absolutely pure water is a very very bad uh, conductor now the other interesting thing is air air is actually a very poor conductor which is good news for us because if air wasn't a poor conductor every time we got near an electrical outlet we would get electrocuted um, that does not happen because the air is actually a pretty good insulator. And for electricity to travel through the air, you need a lot, a lot, a lot of energy. Um, and you see that with the buildup of uh, lightning strikes. Lots of energy required in those. All right. Well, let's talk about how objects are charged. Well, back in the, um, you know, 600 BCE, before the Common Era, sometimes referred to as BC as in before Christ. Um, the ancient Greeks did a lot of work um, with using materials such as amber and um, fur cloths. Now, amber, what is amber? That's the resin uh, that comes out of a cedar tree and it has that sort of brownish, yellowy uh, hue to it or what some people refer to as that amber color and that's where it gets its name from. Um, and the ancient Greeks, what they, they, they used this material for, for, for jewelry. Well, the, the philosophers would work with this material as well. And they noticed that a peculiar thing would occur when they would um, polish the materials. So they would take a piece of amber and then they would rub it with a piece of cloth or some fur. And what they discovered is that when they would rigorously polish the this amber these two things became electrically attracted to little tiny bits of straw so little bits of straw would stick to both the amber and the cloth but what really confused the philosophers at the time and you have to remember there weren't scientists back then they were philosophers but they would have been the same type of people what really confused them is why this would occur only after causing um after the polishing process it would never occur when it was just sitting there you could just you could place the amber on on the straw nothing you put the cloth cloth on the straw nothing but the moment you did some uh aggressive polishing both the amber and the cloth would be covered with these bits of straw and they couldn't really figure it out so the ancient greeks they gave it a name um and they called it the amber effect. Well, what's interesting is the Greek word for amber is electron spelled with a K. Um, and the amber effect is called electrix. So that's where we got the name electron and electricity from. A little cool little bit of history for you. So basically, here's what goes down. So we need a little bit of background information. First of all, under normal conditions, all objects contain positive and negative charges called protons and electrons. That is always true. There's always going to be both positives and negatives. Now, normally, objects are neutrally charged. And neutral objects have equal numbers of electrons and protons. And electrons are negatively charged and protons are positively charged. So if you have an equal number of both, that means the charge is going to be zero. Perfectly balanced. Now, negatively charged, negatively charged objects have more electrons than protons. Positively charged objects have more protons than electrons. And that's the key there. So 
For it to be negative, the electrons have to outnumber. For it to be positive, the protons have to be outnumber. The protons have to outnumber. Now remember, here's the 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 important concept. The protons aren't free to move. The protons are stuck. So here's a good example. So let's take a look at the neutral object. Let's count the electrons or negative charges first. So we've got one, two, three, four, and let's count the positive charges. One, two, three, four. We have equal positives and equal negatives. As a result, the charge on this is zero elemental charges. Now let's take a look at this. So if we do the count, we've got one, two, three, four of the positives, but we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the negatives. So we have, and let's, uh, let's color these. We've got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now we've already matched protons with electrons and the rest are surplus. So the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, these are the extra electrons. So this has a negative charge of four elemental charges, negative four elemental charges. And let's take a look at this one. Again, four positive charges, but now we only have two negative charges. That means what we have left over is we have a surplus of two positive charges. So this is gonna have a ch charge of positive two E. So next, let's talk about how these objects get charged. Well, let's take a look at our first object here. Again, these two objects are neutrally charged. We know that they're neutrally charged because we have one, two, three, four positives and one, two, three, four negatives. So they balance out. Same thing over here, four positives, four negatives. But then what we do is we rigorously rub them together. So this is a similar trick uh, that many kids do is when they take a balloon and they rub it against their hair. That process causes um, the heat to build up as a result of the friction. So what's occurring is that when you rub them together, <clears throat> some of the electrons break free of their atoms on this material, and then some of the electrons break free from this other material, <clears throat> which causes them to be free to move to one material or the other. But what happens is some of these electrons that are on the right-hand side jump over to this material on the left-hand side. Now, why does that occur? Well, it's because these two materials are different. And this one ha has a property which is called more electronegative. So this one's more electronegative. So basically what this means is this material is a bully. It has a stronger pull on electrons. So when the two surfaces vibrate back and forth, these charges want to go back to their original partners. But these materials have such a strong draw that they steal a couple of extra electrons. So then this becomes negatively charged and this one becomes positively charged. And that's how, um, that's how you can see it here. So we see these two charges migrated over here. So now we have a total of four positives here, four positive elemental charges. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six el negative elemental charges. And that gives us a grand total of negative two. And as you can see on this side, we had four positive charges and now only two negative charges. And what we're left with is two positive charges, negative two, positive two. So the charges have to balance out uh, between the two materials. It just means that one material is more negative than the other. And again, that has to do with this one material having a stronger affinity to those valence electrons. Um, and we call that property the electronegativity. And basically it's the idea of a similar analogy to two magnets fighting it out. The larger magnet here has a stronger pull. So even though both are pulling on this piece of metal, this magnet with the stronger pull is gonna more likely steal the ball bearing away from the magnet with the smaller uh, amount of pull. And that's how we get a little bit of charging just by friction. So some other concepts, charges attract or repel depending on their relationship. And here is that relationship. Like charges repel. So if the charge, so if these are like charges, positive and positive or negative and negative, they're going to push away from each other. Unlike charges, these attract each other. So protons and electrons are always attracted to each other. Protons and protons are always repulsed and electrons and electrons are always repulsed. And that is always true. So the law of attraction and repulsion states that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. So electrons repel other electrons, protons repel other protons, but protons and electrons 
attract each other. So now let's go little history lesson here. Why are the electrons negative? Okay, so it had to do with Ben Franklin. Now, some of you are maybe a little bit familiar with Ben Franklin. Uh, others are not sure, but Ben Franklin is the one that flew the kite during an electrical storm um, and the uh, was an electrical experiment. Well, he what he was trying to do, he was actually trying to prove that the stuff that made up lightning was the same stuff that made sparks when you walked across a floor and hit a doorknob. So Ben Franklin's experiment was um, a, a simple, a simple one, but rather reckless. Um, so he, he more or less had a mason jar. Well, first of all, he had a kite, of course. So he had a kite, and he had this kite flying in the air during an electrical storm, and he had some conductive wire, and he was holding on to the wire here. It's the my best representation of a hand here. Pretty terrible. And then this went inside a glass jar, like a mason jar. And inside that, he had the wire attached to a key, a metal key. Now, this metal key um, would sit in here and it was isolated from the environment. And as he was flying during this electrical storm, he would see bolts of lightning in the sky. Now, these bolts of lightning, when they got near the kite, would cause blue sparks to fly off the key. And every time there was a lightning strike, he would see nearby the kite, he would see the blue sparks. So he was able to prove that the stuff that made up lightning was the same stuff that um, caused shocks. The funny thing is though, he was incredibly likely to survive this experiment. What most scientists believe is that none of the lightning strikes actually hit the kite. They just hit near the kite, luckily. So what happened was a little bit of the electricity from this lightning bolt, just a little bit, because remember, air is a pretty terrible conductor. It's really not great. And it was raining, so it made it a slightly bit more conductive. So only a little bit of that electrical energy went into the line and then went down in here. So not enough to kill him, but just enough to cause the sparks in the key. The other, the next two scientists who tried to repeat the experiment, uh, they weren't so lucky. Um, so they realized that that was a very dangerous experiment. And uh, after uh, they lost two scientists and tried to recreate it, realized that, um, yeah, that's not something, that's something you can't do. So <clears throat> Ben Franklin was trying to figure out what this whole deal was. Okay, so he went back to that same experiment. And that was the one I was talking earlier about, about what the ancient Greeks did. So let's talk about that. So he tried to take that uh, amber example a little bit further. So here we have our piece of amber. And again, we have our cloth. All right. And when he polished the amber with the cloth, the same thing happened as it did with the ancient Greeks. These two became electrically charged. So Ben Franklin was like, well, okay, so what's causing this charge? Well, the idea of the day was this idea of electric fluid. So what he thought is that when you polished the piece of amber, some of this electric fluid flowed from the amber to the cloth. Now, here's the thing. He didn't know. He was just taking an educated guess. <clears throat> so why did he assume that the electrical fluid would flow from the amber to the cloth? Well, I would argue that he probably thought that the cloth, like any other cloth, is good at absorbing fluids. That's what we use cloths to do. We have a cloth. You have a spill. You put, in a, you, you, you put down a cloth. The spill gets attracted and gets soaked up into... Um, in, into that material. So he probably reasonably assumed that this um, material would also absorb this electrical energy, um, this electric fluid, I should say. So that means he defined this as being negatively charged because it lost some of the fluid. If it loses some of it, it's negatively charged. Where this gained the fluid and it became positively charged. Great. And now convention lasted for years and years and years, hundreds of years. Um, but the problem was that model of electricity was incorrect. And it wasn't until about 100 years later um, when um, a guy by the name of J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. The discovery of the electron changed everything about electricity. But here's the thing. A lot of the conventions that we have today in electric circuits, they were established back in Ben Franklin's day in the 1700s, right? Well, it wasn't until 1897 when J.J. Thompson 
discovered the electron. So we had many, many, many years where all the electric circuits that were designed at that time, right, were based on this old idea. So instead of trying to rewrite history, they just simply stuck with it and just put a little footnote saying, oh yeah, by the way, everything's wired backwards. So this explains the phenomena as it turns out. And here's the thing. There is no electric fluid. What it is, is that some of the electrons from here migrate over because of that whole electronegativity thing that I was talking about. But you can't b blame Ben Franklin. He had no idea, right? He didn't know what an electron was. Nobody did. So he just took a guess. Well, he had a 50-50 chance of being right, and he was wrong. <laughs> As it turns out, the amber is the one that actually pulls over the negative charges. Well, here's the thing. Since it was already established that amber was negatively charged, and now it was the electrons that moved over. For this to happen, these electrons had to be considered negatively charged to fit with this accident of history. And that's why electrons have a negative charge instead of a positive one. Kind of cool, eh?